Good morning, everyone. I can see the room is starting to fill up. It's Sharon Avery from the Toronto Foundation. We're going to get started at eight o'clock sharp in about two minutes. So uh, make yourselves comfortable. Feel free to check in on the chat uh, and greet everyone. Um, and uh, we will be opening up the poll uh, momentarily. Good morning, everyone. It's Sharon Avery from the Toronto Foundation, and the room is starting to fill up. We have about 250 people registered this morning. As you come in, feel free to open up your chat and greet the uh, others that are here. About half the room represents organizational leaders, and half the room are donors, funders, and caring Torontonians. And we're just so glad you're here for our fifth um, webinar. We have a, a four amazing panelists today. It's going to be a tight conversation. So come on in the room, join us. The poll is open. We just like to take a temperature on who's joined us today. And if you're so inclined and you want to write down in chat a word that describes how you're feeling five weeks into this crisis, we welcome those words. Uh, the chat is an important part of uh, this discussion today. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to get this kicked off because we have a very full agenda for the next hour and I can see the room is filling up very quickly. For those of you that have joined us in the past, this is our fifth um, Better Toronto Coalition webinar and we're so grateful for you to join us. If you're new to this, um, we do a lot of conversation in the chat and we do a lot of conversation with our panelists. Um, I think uh, you all know that our goal is to create um, a weekly gathering uh, of Torontonians who care about their communities and their neighbours and want to do something about it. So I hope that our conversation today inspires you to act, whether acting uh, involves you getting involved with a, a new organisation. We, we really do focus on the small medium orgs on the front lines of this uh, crisis. Um, or whether it, it involves you giving money. And uh, I'm really thrilled that, that uh, we have a, an incredible panel to talk about uh, the issue of race today. Um, we've been really focusing on those cross-cutting issues with this crisis. Last week, we had a great panel on gender. Uh, our next panel will be on mental health, um, but today, a really critical topic. You all know the drill now, the poll is open. We hope that you will um, uh, take a minute and tell us who you are. We want to make sure we've got the right mix uh, joining us and are encouraging every week for you to invite new people to join us. Those of you that uh, represent organizations across Toronto, do not hesitate to introduce yourselves to the room and feel free to jump in and answer questions as they come up uh, or make comments. For those of you that are here to learn, um, don't hesitate to put your questions in chat as soon as they come to you. We will be collecting them. We have 20 minutes uh, of Q&A at the end. I, um, and a quick welcome to our speakers, of course, Helene, Sam, Debbie, and Anna, who I will introduce properly in a few minutes. Um, uh, I think it's always important, um, especially when we're our topic today, but always to acknowledge the land that we work on um, in Toronto has been a meeting place of the First Peoples for thousands of years, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and most recently Mississaugas of the Credit. We heard from Pamela Hart last week um, at Native Child, uh, sorry, Native Women's Resource Center um, about some of the pre-existing conditions that make COVID-19 a bigger threat to Indigenous women women compared to other groups and it is so appropriate for our conversation today as well. 
Um, we are going to be talking about uh, how being a member of a racialized community or a newcomer to Canada are factors in how people will fare during this crisis. One of the challenges we face when we put together vital signs each year, our annual quality of life study on the City of Toronto, is the inadequate collection of race-based data for quality of life indicators. Um, well, there are reports of how minority groups in the United States have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. We do not have those numbers ready available in Canada. In fact, we have a real discomfort with that. And it's, it's one of the things our panelists want to talk about um, once we come back together at the end of this uh, conversation. We do know for certain that Toronto was already a city of widening wealth and income disparity. Um, data over the last 35 years shows that racialized populations and newcomers have had no income growth, while the rest of the population has often had greater than 50% income growth. We know um, that last year unemployment rates were at their lowest in decades, um, but those rates mask temporary and part-time work and often um, forced self-employment with no benefits, uh, which all feels sort of like old data now, but I think it's important context for what uh, we entered COVID-19 with. We know that racialized residents and newcomers disproportionately hold more of the precarious jobs, um, and there's a gender lens on that one too, um, or they did. Fast forward to today, with skyrocketing unemployment levels, we can connect the dots to see that racialized groups and newcomers are being harder hit by layoffs, or on the flip side, may feel compelled to keep working in riskier environments. Couple these conditions with greater susceptibility to pre-existing health conditions, unequal access to healthcare, and oftentimes institutionalized racism in the healthcare system, it seems clear that the impacts of COVID-19 are likely to more adversely affect some Torontonians more than others. We could probably talk to each of these leaders that we have with us today for an hour independently. They all have interesting backgrounds and are doing important work. But because we have an hour in total, we're going to do our best to at least start to create a better understanding of what some newcomers and members of racialized communities are up against. And I hope that we can work together as a community proactively to shape the outcomes for the better. So in that context, I'm going to bring our guests into this conversation now um, and uh, remind uh, those who have joined us um, uh, in the audience uh, to ask your questions and communicate with each other and answer questions as we go along. And I'm, I'm going to start. I'm so delighted um, that uh, uh, Helene Dale was able to join us from Chicago this morning. I know it's an hour earlier there. You look fresh um, and I know you've been incredibly busy. This crowd um, understands the basics of what a community foundation is, but Chicago is like twice our age and three times our size um, in terms of a community foundation. So Helene, I wondered if you would just start with a short summary of what uh, makes Chicago Trust special. And don't forget to unmute your uh, microphone. Yeah, uh, thanks. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you. You know, as a native Buffalonian, um, I, Toronto and Ontario is very close to my heart. Um, you know, I always, when we crossed that bridge, I always felt like, you know, I was uh, going to kind of a twin um, city in many ways. So. You know, Toronto is, is uh, a, a city that I hold very dearly. Um, you know, the Chicago Community Trust has been around for about 105 years. It was one of the first uh, community foundations in the United States uh, right after Cleveland, which actually started the community foundation uh, movement in the United States. And um, we've been a trusted partner in the Chicago region for all of those years. Um, and serve as an opportunity for people who want to invest in their communities to um, invest as, as donors to the trust and then trust us to be partners in helping them understand how they can have the greatest impact um, here in Chicago, in the Chicago region. So, you know, we pride ourselves in understanding the community, being close to the community, understanding the needs, and really helping donors who want to invest have the greatest impact on creating positive social change here. 
you've been focused uh, prior to COVID on racial and ethnic wealth gaps in, in the Chicago region. Can you give us an overview of what that strategy looked like before the pandemic? Yeah, so, you know, I've been at the trust just over a couple of years now. And when, when I came, we went on a journey, if you will, to think about how we could most effectively deploy our resources to have the greatest impact. And while there are many issues here in Chicago, um, health disparities, lack of access to uh, high quality education, um, violence, et cetera, you know, we, we recognize that underneath all of those is this um, ever present and growing issue of the wealth gap. And that if we could work on the economic underpinnings that really in many ways are the root causes for so many of the other challenges that we face here, that we could probably have a, a longer and more sustained impact. So we decided to have as our highest organizational priority um, closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap and really looking at uh, particularly in Black and Latinx populations where that wealth gap is, is the most pronounced. How could we put together a strategy that addressed those issues? So the stats we're seeing uh, from the states are that though um, Chicago, uh, black residents in Chicago make up 29% of the population. They currently make up 72% of those who have died from COVID and 52% uh, of those tested positive for COVID are, are uh, people of color. And so I guess the question is, how are you guys approaching those crazy statistics? Well, first of all, um, you know, and my background is as a public health physician, and I spent a, many uh, decades working on um, infectious disease control, and particularly HIV and, and AIDS, and not dissimilar from the HIV pandemic. Um, while it initially seemed like it was an um, equal opportunity virus, if you will, and uh, I think we quickly saw that it had its greatest impact on communities of color. And so I wasn't surprised when these same numbers and the same patterns evolved. And I think it's a, it is a part of a um, unfortunately uh, well-known story that if uh, the general population catches a cold, uh, communities of color catch pneumonia. And that the underlying social and economic inequities predispose people to the to the diseases that then also predispose them to poor outcomes in this epidemic, and that the social and economic factors uh, also make those the uh, communities of color more at risk for catching this virus because of the nature of their work, the nature of their home lives, um, the, the economic insecurity that existed. And so in our response to COVID, we have um, made sure that we highlight the, the underlying vulnerabilities so that we can get resources to the communities where the needs are greatest um, and where this epidemic has uncovered, once again, the longstanding inequities that are underlying um, the vulnerability for this disease. I guess my last question, um, I know with your extensive international experience, one of the phrases that's often used in emergencies is this idea of building back better. And I know in the community foundation movement across Canada, we're starting to just start to talk about what does stabilization and recovery begin to look like? Um, not because we think we're there, but because we wanna be ready for it. What does build back better mean to you right now? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think what it means is how can we um, look at the things that we're doing in an emergency response and think about doing those in a more long term sense so that we give that kind of resiliency to populations who are most vulnerable. And so, you know, we're looking at uh, many of the things that we're doing now and thinking about how can we carry those over in a more long term sense and the focus on this unequal um, vulnerability gives us the opportunity in a way 
to really hammer hard on those issues and, and put in place programs and policies that continue to address this inequity. Um, and so, you know, I think this notion that we should have an equitable recovery and not just a recovery that focuses on um, big business or the top of the house, but we've got to make sure that the foundation is once and for all um, really the focus, because if our foundation is weak, it doesn't matter what we do at the top of the house. Ultimately, we have a house of cards and the next shock is going to be just as bad, if not worse. So I think this uh, puts a greater urgency on this issue that we've been focused on uh, around economic equity so that we make sure we're putting policies and programs in place that protect um, low-wage workers, that give children access to broadband so that they can um, have online learning, so that we uh, have more flexible loans to small businesses that are oftentimes the ones that are most hard hit, um, that we protect low-wage workers from having to make choices between whether they put food on the table or whether they send themselves out to get a deadly infection. So, you know, I think there are a lot of lessons from here that we can take into our policies and our programs um, to really firm up the foundation and make us uh, a more equitable economy overall. Thank you, Helene. And, and it's interesting, I think the conversation we're having in Canada is, is in addition to all that is, is, is a living wage now a conversation uh, government might tolerate uh, in a different way than it ever has before. And so I think there's a lot of bigger discussions for us on that. And I thank you for um, that contribution for now. I think I'm gonna move to Sam Chase now, um, the executive director of the Christie Refugee Welcome Center. And I think this gets, this gets really interesting when you go from Helene's big picture uh, for a whole region um, in the States and, and where they're at. And we get really granular, Sam, in terms of your reality at the Christie Refugee Welcome Center. So let's talk a little bit about your organization. And I always ask people to toggle between what it was before and then go straight into what is it today during the COVID crisis? Sure. Well, we are usually uh, the first bed that someone sleeps in when they arrive in Canada, if they arrive in Canada to make a refugee claim. Uh, so we serve refugee claimant families. So a lot of the people in our shelter are children, they're all families, and they have all arrived in Canada recently to make a refugee claim. So we provide a safe room and uh, food, but then we also uh, give them support as they walk through the process of settling in Canada. We help them figure out how to make a refugee claim. We get the kids into school. Um, we take care of them in our on-site clinic. And we also invest a lot of time into helping them find housing uh, because we're meant to be short term because pre-COVID, 150 refugees arrived in Canada every day. So we need to make space for them and kind of move them into housing. And then we continue to support them um, after they leave the shelter. So in some ways, we're still doing that, but it's very different now because a lot of the things around us have completely stopped. The, refugee claim process has completely stopped. So people are kind of stuck. And uh, of course, schooling now takes place online in rooms, not in school buildings. Uh, so, you know, we're still feeding them, but now they take food back to their rooms instead of eating in our dining room. Um, we have uh, a lot of, a number of our families have found housing in the last three or four weeks. And we've deliberately kept those rooms empty to just to create more space in the shelter. So there's more opportunity for a social distancing and space. Uh, we've got uh, tablets for all of the kids. We bought them uh, so they could access education uh, and have a tablet all to themselves. And um, probably one of the ch biggest changes is we've always shown up in support and friendship to people, um, but that's really an important factor now just to be present um, on site uh, so they don't feel alone. And uh, yeah, so that's, you know, in some ways we're still there to walk with them on their journey, but uh, the way we're doing it is very different um, now that COVID is around. Who, who are you seeing as the most vulnerable populations that you work with, Sam? And do you have any particular stories that stand out from the last week or so? Well, 
I mean, in some ways, refugees in general are the most vulnerable. vulnerable. Um, they're facing the same things that other vulnerable populations in Canada are facing, but they also don't have immigration status. Sometimes they don't speak the same language as uh, the people around them. They don't understand how to apply on things and that sort of thing. But I think the increased vulnerability happens because um, life still happens for refugees. So we had um, a young family move in uh, late in the year and um, uh, the mom was pregnant. And so she had her uh, baby in January. We had one baby born to us in January, another one more recently. And there are just some health concerns around at the baby. So it's just that added dimension of life still happens while you're facing all of the COVID related things, while you're facing your own precarious status as, as a refugee. So it's just an added dimension of having to um, figure out that greater complexity, which for most of us, even just having a child who's unwell, that's enough. <laughs> that would consume our entire attention, but now it's immersed in this greater, uh, greater reality for them. It's been an ongoing theme in our webinar conversations is the levels of privilege some of us have and what is what constitutes a, a real problem. Uh, what what is challenge um, and uh, I find um, the stories, uh, particularly of newcomers, particularly um, those we, we had uh, the gang from Massey Center on a couple weeks ago talking about um, pregnant teenagers who have been you know kicked out of their homes and they're they have no support network and they're scared and i think um these are the the populations we're we're so seriously concerned about um how is socialization how is socialization i'm struggling this morning social isolation and the stress of working affecting your staff this is another theme we've heard sam and and uh, i think it's important um we keep talking about these are vulnerable populations you're serving, but you're also a vulnerable organization. And how are your staff dealing with the stress? Right. Well, you know, we've got a pretty great group of staff. Um, I love working with them. Um, we, um, at the very beginning, just acknowledged that. And we um, we kind of pilfered a saying from uh, Friday Night Lights where we're, we talked about um, clear minds, warm hearts, um, Oh, no, I, no, I can't do it. Anyway, it's one of those <laughs> clear heads, open hearts, something else. Anyway, this is awful. I hadn't planned to say this, but because we yeah, wanted we'll, to. We'll invite anyone who's listening and is a Friday Nights fan to put yeah. it in chat for you. Sam. Except I kind of edited it. One of my staff is on. So, Steve, if you if you remember what it is, type it in. But because um, I knew what I knew we would figure out what to do. But what mattered was our heart and our courage and our resilience to be able to do it. Um, because we really wanted to show up with full authenticity to this and not try and pretend these are normal times, but also not run away screaming. So we kind of set the tone right away with that. We've started to do a weekly staff wellness letter, just sending them links and articles that might help them navigate personally, not professionally, but personally through this. Um, I do a lot of that just one-on-one -on -one with staff. Um, We've created an on-site, off-site staff rotation. So we have fewer staff in the building, but more can do stuff from home. So everyone's present at some point, but we're kind of acknowledging that. So um, it's just about really supporting one another and acknowledging that we've never been here before. So let's not pretend this is normal, but let's still show up and serve. Well, the, the guests have shown up because it's clear eyes full hearts can't lose and I've seen it about 60 times go by in chat so there's definitely a lot of Friday Night Lights uh, uh, viewers here and I think but I do in seriousness I think setting a tone is is seems to be a key leadership um, piece for this in terms of getting your staff through it so I'm going to shift gears now Sam and move to Debbie Douglas um, the executive director of the Ontario Council of Agencies serving immigrants uh, to share her insights with us. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning. Um, it's, uh, it's, these are challenging times, and I imagine they were challenging times before COVID. Tell us about the Council of Agency Serving Immigrants before and today. Um, OCASI, as you know, is the umbrella organizations for agencies uh, that work with immigrants and refugees, um, folks with precarious status, but we're also 
necessarily concerned around issues of race and gender and economic um, stability. Um, we uh, work, we have a dual mandate um, in terms of our ad policy advocacy work, but we are also charged with building the capacity of the sector. You've just heard from Sam. So many of our agencies do very similar work to what Sam um, just talked about, as well as what you will hear later from, from Anna. Um, before COVID, we, have a, we had a number of initiatives planned. Um, we just got, went through um, Refugee Rights Day. We would be celebrating the 35th anniversary of the Singh decision and then necessarily um, had to cancel all of those plans. Um, Try to recoup by having an online conversation um, on April 4th, but nothing can replace the kind of coming together um, of those who have gone through the refugee experience and those who work with um, immigrants and refugees. Um, so that was just one example of the changes. Um, like many organizations, um, most of our work has moved online. Um, the kind of capacity building that we do in terms of research and training on various issues are continuing online, but certainly have had to cancel our in-person um, meetings. Um, we've, we've also, um, of course, shifted our advocacy priorities. Um, not that we've completely thrown away what we've been working on for um, the last while, but some have been brought into much sharp, sharper focus. And so we've been spending um, our time paying attention to ensuring that folks have access to the various income supports that's being announced. We're particularly um, concerned ar ar around um, populations that may not that may not have formal att attachment to our labor market. So we are concerned around folks um, with precarious immigration status, whether or not they're refugee claimants, whether or not they're undocumented. Um, Sam talked a bit about um, the refugee claimants that they work with. We're particularly concerned about those who are here claiming refugee status based on sexual orientation or gender identity expression and sexual characteristics. Um, many of these folks are not necessarily connected to um, any formal organization and the services that they have been accessing, much of those services have moved online, so there isn't a place for them to gather. So the, the, the physical distancing um, rules that are in place are certainly exacerbating um, the kind of isolation that they were already facing. And that that's also includes women um, who are here because of um, gender-based um, vi violence. Um, so, so COVID has basically forced us um, to really drill down in terms of the kind of advocacy focus um, that we have. So it's about income supports, but it's also about ensuring that our agencies are able to do the work that they need to continue to do, whether or not they're online or whether or not they're refugee um, houses, working with government assisted refugees or refugee claimants, where they have staff it on site, but also working from home. What we found is that um, while many agencies were able to provide the necessary technology um, for staff to be able to go home. We have many smaller agencies who have not been able to do that. So we continue to advocate um, with funders and with others to try and get some supports there. Um, as frustrating is the fact that many, many families um, do not have access to technology. So while education has moved online, we know that many immigrant and refugee families have, have large numbers of children. And so even in jurisdictions where school boards are offering um, equipment, it isn't enough. And so we are very concerned around some of those kids who will be left out, um, as concerned around for adults who are doing language classes, who need services and the services are online and where there may be language barriers. So those are some of the things that we're trying to work out um, right now with our, with our member agencies and, and that COVID is proving to be a challenge. Um, for us. You had some strong opinions on the data side, uh, Debbie, in terms of um, what's missing for you. Do you feel you, ha you have enough, um, do you have a good handle on it or is it for you anecdotal and just because of the clients that you serve that you have a sense of how this is um, affecting the people that you, you, you work with? Well, we've been looking at um, the most vulnerable populations. And so, as I said, um, we're particularly concerned about those with precarious immigration status and those who are undocumented. Um, we're hearing of women um, in particular um, who are not only isolating because of the virus, but are isolating because they're afraid of coming out, uh, even accessing food 
because of new regulations in Ontario that police can now stop and ask for ID. Um, these women are afraid of being pardoned, as we call it here in Toronto, and having and then being reported to the Canada Border Services Agency, which which then raises the potential of immigration detention. We have been pushing back very much about this. We think that the Attorney General of Ontario needs to clarify this. Toronto has an access without fear policy. So everyone residing in Toronto, regardless of immigration status, should be able to access food, should be able to leave their homes and be able to go anywhere without fear of being detained. Unfortunately, that is not the reality for many, many people um, who, who are, who are, who are um, afraid um, of, of this new regime where police can stop and ask for ID at any time. And of course, these folks don't have ID. And our experience over the years have shown that when police stop you, um, folks are racially profiled. So if you're racialized in particular, if you're black, um, even more particular indigenous, that you will be around it's for black folks around immigration status. Um, so that continues to be um, a particular um, concern. We're also very much concerned about migrant workers. We know that migrant workers, especially farm workers who have been able to come in um, in the last few weeks are supposed to be quarantined for 14 days. Um, we have directives from the federal government that says that their wages must be paid. What we are hearing um, from the various farms is that some of the farm workers are being told that yes, you will be paid, but that those wages will be clawed back absolutely not what should be happening. The federal government recently announced a $50 million um, subsidy to farmers as a way of supporting farm workers. We need some oversight on this to ensure that um, farm workers do have access to food, that they are getting their wages and that their wages won't be clawed back, that their living situation isn't such so that it, it exposes them even further to, to contracting the virus. We are hearing stories in some of the smaller centers that farm workers are being denied services in grocery stores, that they're being profiled at, at, at the front of the store and being turned away. And as we know, many of these farm workers come from the global south. They're black men, they're Mexican men, um, they're, they're racialized folks. And so racism is alive and well and showing is on the belly, as Helen talked about earlier from Chicago. We're seeing this year, we're hearing it anecdotally. And unfortunately, in, in Ontario and in Canada, we're not collecting um, race-based data. Um, the police is supposed to um, be collecting race and documenting um, the folks that they see, including um, racial characteristics, whether or not that is happening. Um, we probably won't know for until we take a look back um, post-COVID. Um, so, so there are a number of things. One of, one of the conversations that's happening that I think is important um, for us to use as a frame in this conversation is the need for human rights considerations in all of the various um, initiatives that's being rolled out and the conversations that we're having about COVID and how it's impacting on various communities, because we know that the impact is disproportionate based on issues of race and gender and, and issues of ability, of course. It's, you know, I'm going to quote Helene, because I'm going to be thinking about this phrase for a while, which is an equitable recovery. I think, um, I think when we come together at the end of this um, conversation and after I talk to Anna next, um, let's. I think we'll start with what does building back better look like um, from an equitable recovery standpoint. Thank you so much, Debbie, for all of that important information. I'm going to move to Anna Wong, Executive Director of the Community Family Services of Ontario, um, which is formerly the Chinese Family Services of Ontario, to share some insights with us. Anna, welcome. Um, so, uh, like everyone else, just for the sake of uh, the folks in the room, uh, let us know uh, what um, uh, Community Family Services of Ontario does, or at least did before COVID, and, and then what does uh, your reality today look like? Um, so, Community Family Services of Ontario has been around for about 33 years. It's an organization that was founded by Asian immigrants, now led and governed by Asian immigrants with lived experience. And what are the lived experience? Those that are based on our three streams of services. The first one is for, uh, family services, mental health. Uh, the second one is uh, immigrant settlement services. And the third one has to do with disabilities and special needs. We are headquartered in Scarborough and have uh, four uh, satellite offices uh, based on partnership in the York region, Peel region, as well as downtown Toronto. Um, so the before was, you know, there is a sustainable number of domestic violence cases 
and uh, youth and a couple of uh, individual mental health and addictions issues that we were battling. And just like what um, Debbie was saying, we uh, served a dis the population with disabilities and special needs, but based on very hard to get um, data that is specific to race. I myself experienced it uh, when I was doing my doctoral research on inequitable access to health, um, not only across types of disabilities, you know, the visible disabilities such as the mobility ones uh, versus the invisible disabilities such as mental health and speech and communication disabilities. Add a, adding the additional layer of being racialized, these data are very hard to get by. And in fact, I would say that um, um, starting 2016, Census of Canada has decided to not include certain um, uh, disabilities definitions within uh, the survey only because they couldn't um, they couldn't figure out a way how to of how to formula uh, create the formula well or actually put systemic um, provisions into place to help um, uh, tackle those issues. Fast forward to now, what is the the after COVID situation, we see an increase in severity and uh, volume of cases across all three prongs of our services. So in the family services uh, domain, we see an absolute, and it's across the women's service sector, an absolute skyrocketing rocketing cases um, in, in terms of domestic violence. So it's based on isolation. Um, the vulnerable partner, usually the female partner, who is dependent on the perpetrator for accommodation, for financial support and access to their loved ones, you know, be it the seniors, the children or the pet, um, are usually being held hostage, right? So they're, they're um, limiting, they have limited access to social support and um, they are granted certain rights within the family if they meet certain conditions and that's within the family itself. It's not even being held hostage outside. Now with the COVID, they have the additional threat of um, the pandemic. So in, uh, in some cases we hear from the victims saying, um, I, I'm not allowed to do this, I'm not allowed to do that. I'm only allowed to stay home with no access to phone or internet because I was told that the government called my house and I I am in a confirmed case when it's actually not true. Um, the perpetrators are actually leveraging the, love, the low level of awareness and understanding of the system by the um, victim and therefore making it very convenient for them to do so in terms of um, exerting uh, domestic violence. Uh, the second part of our services is the um, disabilities and uh, special needs. Uh, we see a higher number of at-risk cases of um, you know, previously very emotionally vulnerable as well as those with intellectual abilities such as autism. Um, you know, uh, they become higher risk and there are more attempts of suicide and there are actually reported cases of suicide with the combination of um, disability, uh, mental disabilities plus mental health vulnerability. Uh, for now, it's not that the cases are not in Canada yet, but we don't want to be the first of the Canadian statistics, right? And lastly, and the um, and the biggest volume of cases what that we see is from the settlement services where exploitation is happening, just like what uh, uh, Debbie was saying, you know, her cases were farm workers. We have um, cases coming in of labor trafficking, um, asking uh, victims asking for help. So these individuals actually came to Canada not long ago, probably for a few months on, you know, uh, legit work permits with contracts and all of that stuff. And a lot of these are actually closed work permits. What that means is they can only work for one employer and not any other employer in the province and they cannot do any other things but work. So they cannot go to school or, or anything. So they're on that permit, which is essentially being held hostage by the employer. Now with the economic downturn, the employers, some of them are telling them, I'm just going to go through the books to pay you all these employment employers health tax, make the deductions and show on payroll that you've been paid, but you pay me back all that money in cash or else I terminate the agreement and you will be left, left with precarious status. So people like this are susceptible to actually homelessness. Now, without the proof of a sustainable work, they are not going to be able to uh, 
um, actually rent proper places to live in. And coupled with the fact that they look Asian, um, the stigma associated with the pandemic this time um, ha hits Asians the hardest and therefore being um, not enough income proof and having the Asian face makes it really hard for them to find accommodation. So for a lot of these cases, before they originally received payroll, you know, they are in temporary accommodation arrangements such as Airbnb. And now with situations like this, they have very little options as to, you know, where else to live. And, um, you know, some of them decide to succumb to the threat. And some of them who don't have the means to succumb to the threat of paying back all their wages decide to uh, report to the authorities. But now the authorities are closed. You know, uh, some of the victims are telling me Service Canada is closed. I don't know what to do. And they uh, shoved me to uh, Canadian Border Services. But they, um, at this time, uh, because of the lockdown, CBSA is only taking in a uh, Printed statements, so they are left with no income uh, at risk of accommodation and uh, no one to follow up on their cases on behalf of them. So, wow! Uh, I, I, you, as I said at the beginning, we could talk to each of you for an hour at least um, in terms of uh, what you're facing right now. How could um, anyone uh, participating today help Anna? What does help look like for you guys? Um, in terms of financial help, you know, if we, if there's more resources for service providers from any level of the government or from the community, uh, it would it, it's going to expand access to uh, uh, professional providers who have the talents and registrations and means to serve these clients. So in our cases, what we have done is uh, we have moved all of our services online. So it's going to be done via phone or video. Um, and uh, the, uh, we are actually deemed essential services, but we cannot actually conduct in-person services because the uh, Ministry of Health Directive says that we need to provide a status supply of um, uh, PPE to our staff, which as a community organization, it's hard for us to get access to. So um, in order for the clients to be able to receive these services, they need access to the phone and the internet. A lot of these people don't. And the risk imposed on them of not having this is now they are only dependent on their family for sources of information. And that could be a potential risk if the family turns out to be the perpetrator. So um, uh, the help, the material help for the community could be, you know, um, helping them with get ac to getting access to food. And so it could be purchasing food or transporting food that's going to help the isolated seniors isolated people with disability and those with um, barriers against travel um, and then the uh, financial or resource um, backfill to community organizations is going to empower them to um, um, uh, retool their existing uh, lines of services to provide quick access services particularly focusing on the current needs. So for what we can serve now, we can actually up our um, services on mental health and domestic violence for a quick access so they get it the same day on the same call. That would help especially those who are in isolated situations where they only have a very short window of time to act to get help when their abusive partner is um, otherwise occupied. It's also gonna help um, uh, healthcare workers who are on the front line working long shifts with a very small window of rest and personal time. Um, uh, we, as the community with the additional resources are doing our part in helping to reach out to deeper in the community within the families to um, pick up the isolated and hidden cases. And we're also training additional uh, capacity for the profession during this time so that we can do a better and more sustainable model coming out of this tsunami out of it. And, and when we are actually in the mode where people can actually come out of their homes, we're gonna hit by another wave of a huge tsunami of in-person requests for help. Uh, we need to be not only equipped now, but for um, the future. And that's, a, that's actually a great place for 
I do think uh, uh, I'd love to get to a recovery conversation by the end of this. Mm -hmm. Can Aruna, Aruna, can I get you to put all our panelists up now on the screen and, and let's have a group conversation. Um, I, I was going to start with data and it turns out uh, uh, one of our, one of my favorite fund holders has sent in a great question that, I, that uh, uh, connects to data and how to help. So I'm going to read it to you and get some feedback from the group. Um, uh, on collecting race-based data, public health in Canada is not collecting data on um, SES on COVID patients who are succumbing to the disease. This is a huge miss. What can we do to advocate for this to be looked at? Um, uh, the uh, P PHAC, which I think must be something around human rights, states that can Canadian lives matter. But we have seen the stark difference differences and inequity of how the disease affects certain vulnerable populations. Um, and what I'm hearing, what I've heard in a couple of our conversations this morning is that it seems like the police have no trouble asking about race, but why are we so uncomfortable asking about it on surveys and, and important ways that we could be collecting that data? Does anyone want to take a start at that? I'm going to I'm going to look at Debbie or Sam, maybe Debbie. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. And just to correct this, not that the police wants to collect race data, the police um, uh, racially profiles and yet continues to resist having to document um, the fact that they continue to stop folks who are racialized, particularly black and um, black folks. Um, so in terms of race data, PHAC is the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, and they've constantly um, refused as the same way the Ontario Ministry of Health when we were legislating and putting in place an anti-racism legislation here in Ontario, um, the Ministry of Health is the um, outlier in terms of not um, being forced to collect um, race-based race race -based data. Um, Helen talked about the underlying um, uh, health factors for racialized communities in Chicago, very similar here in Ontario and across Canada. Um, racialized communities, Black, Asian, um, South Asian communities, uh, you see higher numbers in terms of hypertension, in terms of diabetes, um, in, term, in terms of for women, for women of color, especially Black women, in terms of fibroids and those kinds of things. And so they are far more susceptible um, to these diseases. We also see their numbers on, um, overrepresented in low wages, in, in, in poverty numbers. Um, and so we know that the fact that um, workplaces have closed, those folks are being hardest hit. We need to understand what is happening to those communities and we can only do so, including those who are um, contracting the virus, those who are dying and those who are hospitalized. And because our responses must be specific to the communities that are most effective, whether or not we're talking about social income or we're talking about healthcare, and so and so, I think we need we need our academics to be making noises. We need our opposition parties um, to be pushing on this. We need the NDP in Ontario to take this up as a critical issue, along with the Green Party, and we and we need civil society organizations. Um, we need organizations like the Toronto Fem Community Foundation to be speaking up about the importance of race-based data as as well as collecting data based on immigration status and who is being impacted by these diseases. And I think the challenge in Canada is we have these very great values of inclusion and diversity and welcome, but we kind of tie ourselves up in knots around that, around what we're allowed to do and what we what we can't do. And, um, you know, I think we need to have good uh, policies in place around what the data is for and how it's used for and, and, and all those kinds of things. But um, and it's it, this is a similar case to refugees. If you're in if you're in Toronto, uh, Toronto will serve anyone regardless of precari of uh, immigration status. But how do you get placed in a refugee shelter uh, without you know being asked whether you are a refugee claimant? So we kind of aren't supposed to ask, but we kind of ask because how else do you target services um, to the right population groups without finding out who's there and how they're being affected? So we kind of need to get over that way we're kind of tangled up in this. And we've seen we've seen the sorry, we've seen we've seen um the positiveness of take of collecting race-based data, right? When the Toronto Board of Education started collecting race-based data over a decade ago, we have seen the changes that have happened in terms of being able to begin to put targeted programs in place to stem, for example, the push out and dropout rates of black students, particularly Somali students. We have seen the fact that we, because we collect race-based data based on administration and what the teachers and administrators look like, we've able to put in place things to ensure um, movement 
of folks through the system so that we, when, we, when we have schools with majority um, students of color, that the teachers and the principals are, are representative of those communities. Long way to go, but at least we know that when we have the data, we respond to the, to the concerns that the data is pointing out. I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted someone. No, Go I would. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was uh, obviously I can't speak to the uh, Toronto and Ontario experience, but you know, um, a couple of additional points. Uh, you know, I was doing a lot of work in South Africa right after the um, the fall of apartheid. Mm. There was a there was a really vigorous debate having come out of that very ugly um, situation of an extremely racialized society of whether or not to collect race data. And in a society that wanted to um, see itself as um, you know, equitable from a racial lens and not continue to have those kinds of um, categories that stigmatize. But people recognize that the only way to get to a non-racial society is to actually address the racial wrongs. And without having the data to actually do that, it's hard to really address those wrongs. And so, you know, I think we all struggle with the idea that, you know, are we stigmatizing populations more by collecting the data? But I think unless we actually do that and then work on policies that address those wrongs, we can't get to that next step of a non-racial society. You know, I think the other element that is often missing is how are we including uh, category, how are we including those communities in part of the solution because when we collect data on populations but don't actually include them in the use of the data and how it's going to be used how it's going to be interpreted etc then then it is oftentimes more of a damaging than not because we then do add additional stigma so i think you know first and foremost important to collect the data only way to redress the wrongs but also make sure that we have communities at the center of it and that they get engaged in um, how those data are used and how they're interpreted. Absolutely. Um, I have one more, I think I have time for one more question here before I ask a general final question to you all. Um, so on, our, uh, on CBC, our uh, National Public Radio Metro Morning, um, uh, one of our uh, guests was shocked to hear that Médecins de Sans Frontières is in Canada is going to be working in Toronto with inner city health associates because of the disproportionate effect of COVID on homeless and refugees. I wonder if any of the panelists want to um, comment on this. And I think we're seeing this, I think we've seen um, uh, Good Samaritan's Purse in New York City. I think we're seeing NGOs. I was on a panel with Red Cross yesterday saying a lot of the work that they typically do domestically in Canada, they're actually bringing a lot of their international development work to bear on this pandemic. Um, what what are your thoughts, the local organizations, in terms of how um, that affects your work or or benefits your work or not? First off, I believe it, it's a good thing that um, international forces are stepping up. I would also like to add, though, the fact that we have a diverse population in here, diversity uh, not only because of race, but a residency status and professional statuses. Um, you know, Okasi and a bunch of other, um, uh, the, sector, the immigrant settlement sector has also advocated for the internationally trained uh, medical professionals to step up to the plate uh, this time around. So that's one good thing. And apart from just frontline healthcare, there are other things within the community that can be done, not only to fight the virus, but it's also to um, fight the racism, right? So some of the projects worth mentioning is, um, I believe the Asian community has stepped up um, to share PPE resources um, and to create their own PPE resources uh, one uh, the one sector uh, one uh, for ty one type for the healthcare sector and one type for the community to use without depleting the supply of the healthcare se sector. So this is something that trenches deep into families where individual communities can actually do their part uh, to create a difference as well. And uh, I, I vividly remember this because just last night, my 93 year old grandmother spent till 3 a.m. creating 400 of the homemade masks. So that's just one of many <laughs> projects that is going on in the community. I think um, 
we've recognized in the last couple of weeks that we actually have two stories in this pandemic. And one story is in care homes and shelters, and the other story is just everybody else. And it's playing out very differently. So I think some acknowledgement and some help for those two specific sectors in, in Toronto and, and Ontario is really critical. So on the one hand, it's sad that it got to this point, um, that we would need that. We're a first world country, one of the richest countries on the planet. You know, we just didn't step up when we when we needed to. So I'm glad they're here and I'm very appreciative of inner, of inner city health associates. And one other point um, on that, you know, I, um, having spent a lot of my career working globally, um, I worry that we are seeing this pandemic as this is affecting our people and we have to hunker down and only pay attention to what's happening in the United States or in Canada or other rich nations and forgetting the fact that there's a whole other part of the globe um, that is going to be hugely impacted, that societies are going to be uh, even more hard hit because they don't have the economic wherewithal or the public health infrastructure. And that, you know, we can't let Africa, South Asia and other parts of the world collapse while we're only worried about our own situation. And I, you know, even as tremendously difficult as this is going to be for us, uh, you know, in rich nations economically, it is going to be disastrous. And this is not the time for us to be thinking in a non-global way about this pandemic. And so, you know, I just want to encourage all of our nations to continue to remember their responsibility for the rest of the world, totally intertwined, even if we didn't care about what was going on from a, you know, from a values-based humanitarian uh, perspective, it is going to have an impact on us if other uh, parts of the world are devastated, leading to political unrest, uh, greater spread of the virus globally, et cetera. So this is not the time to only think about our own. We've got to make sure that we're thinking globally about this pandemic. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that when in Canada's response, um, we must also include our international obligations. And that's why I say when we talk about um, the pandemic, we have to think about it within um, a human rights framework, including our international obligations. And, you know, thinking thinking about that whole phrase, equitable recovery, you yeah. know, we shut down lots of things. And, you know, one of the things we've shut down is we've shut the border to refugee claimants, right? Which is just right. one group. And when, and I, I understand, I get it. Um, but that's got to be one of the steps towards a recovery uh, because we are part of a larger world and we actually have a lot of um, a lot of resources that can be offered in terms of who we are as a people as well as just our wealth as a country and we may feel vulnerable but it's not a time to circle the wagons and just protect ourselves. Absolutely and Sam I don't get the, the shutting to, to refugee claimants and um, we're allowing workers in, um, we're allowing folks to come in and refugee claimants I think should be allowed in under the same quarantine like everybody else that we're allowing for labor purposes. Yeah, yeah so lots of lots of advocacy still to be done. Well, and I have to just say, this is one of the things that I love about being part of a community foundation um, where you, with, with I, I had the opportunity to work for UNICEF for eight years and I get that global local piece, but I think sometimes we, we, get, we can get hyper-localized at the community level. And I think this is such an important reminder um, of the connection globally. And, and I would say to my, our guests today at the webinar, this is one of the reasons I, I'm a big proponent of giving globally as well as locally. Um, yeah. You can get really zeroed in on your backyard giving and uh, get really protectionist. But um, uh, we, we, you know, we really encourage our uh, fund holders to also be making generous donations internationally, particularly at this time. And not to, to be too dark about it, but on, on the call with Red Cross yesterday, um, they reminded us that it is it is a forest fire season coming um, that that uh, mother nature does not care that there is COVID-19 in our countries and that climate change is still a thing and so um, there are just so many more bigger conversations that we need to keep having through this but I think that this um, has been a great reminder of how connected we are um, cross-border 
uh, around the world and locally. And I thank all of our panelists so much for joining us this morning. Um, and, uh, and being a part of this important conversation that, gosh, I wish it could go on for another whole hour. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much. Um, so Helene, Sam, Debbie, Anna, thank you for taking time. I know um, you have very busy days ahead of you. And Anna, I am not going to be able to get the picture of your 93-year-old grandmother out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Last night. God bless her. Um, many of you uh, who have joined us today, and I see there's a, there's 100 and almost 160 of you in the room, thank you, especially those that have been joining us every week. We are uh, starting next week, we're actually moving to a bi-weekly um, uh, format. We're going we're gonna to take a week off. Um, we are hunkering down, I think, for the long haul. I think uh, initially when we kicked off this series, we thought we might do six and then maybe we'd be coming out of this. Isn't it crazy to even think that a month ago that was our thinking? Um, and so as we hunker down, we are go going to endeavor to um, make a two-week uh, journey of this so that we can do more uh, in the off week to be sharing information and links. Anyone who is on this call and has uh, other shout outs they want to make to organizations that could use support, please feel free to do so in the chat. Um, and uh, we will be giving each of our um, guests an opportunity in our follow up email because we always like to hear who you think we should be funding. I am proud to say that in the last week, Toronto Foundation has activated a million plus in grants, uh, all undesignated, no applications, straight to organizations that we've supported in the past and that are that have joined us on this webinar and that also have been recommended to us by people working on the ground. I think Helene said it very well, um, as did Debbie, that if, if those that are most affected by the issues aren't involved in the decision making, um, you're going to make the wrong decisions. And so we're committed to um, sharing that power and redistributing money based on the recommendations of the experts who are really facing the issues. I also want to thank Green Shield Canada, um, who is a latest supporter of the Better Toronto Coalition Fund. We make a habit of encouraging fund holders and donors to give direct to organizations. Um, but if you want to do something bigger and you want to pool with us, we welcome that as well. But this isn't a fundraising campaign. This is really us just trying to get money flowing as fast as possible. And either way, we welcome uh, your involvement in this crisis um, because it's going to be a long one. So a last word from me, um, uh, be sure to open the follow-up email that comes from this. There are a few questions that didn't get answered that we will answer in uh, that email. And it, our next discussion is scheduled for Thursday, April 30th. We are going to be talking about mental health and a few folks touched on that today. We have some big issues ahead of us uh, from a, a mental health standpoint, and it should be a really powerful conversation as was today. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time. And um, have a great day, everyone, and stay healthy, stay well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank have you. a fabulous day, people.